Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cross Life. How you doing today? I'm, I'm hearing it today. I'm hearing it today. Thank you, praise. Well, they're gone. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship there today. Oh, man. It is a good thing to sing to the Lord. I can tell you that today. Amen? Amen. Well, again, we're so welcome. Welcome online, people. Man, we, we know you're not here physically, but you're here with us spiritually. You're here, here with us in so many different ways. And again, I want to give a shout out to one of our online folks. Uh, they don't make it here. They can't make it here because of the COVID thing and the situation that they're working through. But they're here. Uh, this, this wonderful woman, I love her to death. She, she dropped off some boxes uh, this week and because the Lord had prompted her to make these boxes. They're boxes for women. They got little women things in them and really, really nice stuff. I don't really know makeup and that kind of stuff and a gift card and that kind of thing. We're going to pass those out to somebody. We're going to figure out who needs those. I know the Lord will lead us in that. But again, I just want to shout out again, another person who's stuck at home, but they're here with us. They're online and they're worshiping with us and they're serving the Lord, even though they're not here. Man, I, I, I tell you, I, I love the internet for that reason. There's a lot of ways I don't like the internet, but for that reason, it's an awesome thing and what a blessing it is. So uh, I'm just excited about that and what the Lord is doing in so many different ways. So, well, uh, we're going to kind of jump right in. So if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you, please open your Bibles to uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be starting around verse 18. Uh, today, the message is entitled, The Christian Family. Um, and you'll kind of figure out why as we read this. Let me do, we'll, we'll read it out loud. I'll read it out loud here. We'll look along. I think it'll be on the screen, of course. But just kind of open our hearts as we go to God's Word today. Verse 18, Wives, submit to your husband as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with a sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoers will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for these words of Paul here. Under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit, he lays this out for the Colossians. Colossian church, but he also lays it out for us for the power of the Spirit has brought to us these words. Let them ring in our hearts and our minds today. Let us be open to the truths that you shall reveal to us. Let these truths change us and mold us into your image. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. This passage, in my opinion, kind of nails down the instruction that we got last week where he gave us instruction to, to let God dwell in us richly, right, through his word and through singing, which we just did again. Let God's peace rule in your life, guide your life, it told us to, and that we're to do everything in word and deed in the name of Christ. And to me, it seems like Paul then just transitions to the perfect place for us to, to live out those particular commands I think we're supposed to start right in our own homes, right in our families with these commands. Because think about it. He commands us to let the peace of God rule our lives. Let me ask you a question. How 
how much peace or how peaceful is your home. We're empty nesters, so there's a lot of peace, but that, it, that's just not that. Not just that. I'm talking about shalom, peace in the household. How about letting the word dwell richly in you? Is there Bible study going on in your house? Is there prayer going on in your house? Do everything, whatever you say, whatever you do unto the Lord. Is, is God being honored in your words and your actions in your home? Seems to me that it's a good place to start with those commands that we learned last week. You see, in the family, there's a great opportunity between the husband and wife to live out that, those commands and those relationships. There's opportunity between the parents and the children to live out that relationship and those commands. It actually even moves into our jobs, which is essentially the means of us being able to take care of our families. I, I don't know too many places or people that don't have jobs. And finally, if you are a boss in some way, shape, or fashion in your family, there, we have some bosses in our family, uh, but it may be in your job or, or your school or however you're doing th things, if you fall into that role or category of boss. So while the second half of this passage does move and talk more about kind of work-related things, I kind of kept everything all together here uh, because it, it, I think it works together. The whole dynamic of the family, the whole idea of work within the family, that's always something that's going on. Uh, so in my humble opinion, the people that did the chapter breaks in the Bible here, they got it wrong because we went all the way into chapter 4, verse 1. They should have stopped it there in chapter 3 and picked up in the next verse, because actually the next verse is, is actually, I think, uh, a, a little bit uh, a, a change in terms of switching to how we communicate with each other and with God. So, um, but that's just me. It doesn't matter. It's not, uh, you know, sacred and how they broke down the chapters or whatever. But it also worked out real good in the preaching calendar, so that's why I included it. In. So we got a big message today. We'll only keep you three to four hours as we go through each of these. Woo! Yeah, baby. Uh, I think we might trim that down just a hair, but let's look at the Christian family. And let me, before we get into the message proper, let me just give you a note, though. Paul writes a very, very similar, I call it a sister passage in Ephesians chapter 5. You've probably read it and know it before as well. I'll refer back to that uh, a little bit in this message, but it's very similar, uh, a, a message that he wanted all the churches to get in terms of relationship and family. But I've entitled the, the outline today, Six Keys to Have a Blessed Christian Family. Six Keys to Have a Blessed Christian Family. It, it doesn't, and I'll be honest, the text doesn't say that you're going to get blessed because you do these things. But I'm going to take a little privilege there and just imply that when we do follow the Lord and his commands and his instructions, that blessings come. You, we, we good with that? That's pretty, pretty biblical in that sense. And so I think if we follow these instructions as Paul gives them to them, we will indeed see blessing in the Christian family. Well, number one, Paul doesn't pull any punches here. He just starts out and says, wives, submit to your husbands. Now, I know some of you ladies are not got your pen out. You have a hard time writing that in that blank. I know it. I know it. And, but let me tell you, don't tune me out. Write it down. And let me, let me help you understand exactly what I believe Paul is trying to teach us here. It will encourage you. I'll explain, I think, without soft peddling what is said to bring some understanding. And actually that after you understand this in this way that if you haven't already, you'll, you'll actually desire to be a submissive wife. So, the first thought I want you to bring to mind as you look at this particular passage, husbands submit your wives, or uh, wives submit to your husbands, that you don't look at it in 
isolation. It does have to be looked at in the next verse where husbands are commanded to love their wives. Because, I mean, think about it. Should a Christian husband demand submission for his wife without loving her? Or, look at it this way, should a Christian wife demand love from her husband without being submissive? So again, these two thoughts are always together, always work in tandem, and so don't separate them in that way because I don't think they're ever meant to be. I also want us to see that this command is actually um, elevating the wives. Believe it or not, it actually elevates the wives. And I think we understand this best when we understand the culture to which this is being spoken to. So um, I think there's a... uh, William Barclay is a pastor, author. He, he has a great, I think, understanding of what was taking place in the culture to which this was originally written to. Let me just read it, uh, and I think you'll get an understanding. Basically, he writes, he says, Under Jewish law, a woman was a thing. She was a possession of her husband just as much as his house or his flock or his material goods were. She had no legal rights whatsoever. For instance, under Jewish law, a husband could divorce his wife for any cause, while a wife had no rights whatsoever in the initiation of a divorce. That was just the way it was. This is the culture he's writing this to. He's also writing this to the Greek culture. In the Greek society, he says, a a respectable woman lived in a life of entire seclusion. She never appeared on the streets alone, not even to go to marketing. She lived in in a woman's apartment and did not join her men folk even for meals. For her, there was uh, demanded a complete servitude and chastity. But her husband could go out as much as he chose. He could either enter into as many relationships outside the marriage as he liked and incurred no stigma. But under Jewish and under Greek law, and customs, all privileges belong to the husband and all duties belong to the wife. And so this, this is the, the mindset, the, the culture to which is being spoken to. And the rules, if, if you will, Paul is laying out here are vastly different than the culture he just spoke to. Husbands and wives here are addressed equally. They're, they're, they're being addressed together here. That would never, never be done. And, and if you take the, the, the call there for uh, the wife to, to do it unto the Lord or to and the, love your husband or in the name of the Lord or uh, submit your husband in the name of the Lord, I think you could possibly connect that even to the husband's command as well. And so while submission today in our thought, in our culture, again, is kind of offensive to the way we live, I don't, again, think that's Paul's point here. Paul is affirming what I believe is God-ordained creation in which there's a headship and a leadership role and responsibility that is given to the man. The submission of the wife in a Christian family never, ever, is to be a position of inferiority, either physically or spiritually. I get this. From a verse in Genesis where God says in Genesis 2, 24, therefore let the man, okay, uh, let the man leave uh, his father and his mother, be hold fast to his wife. And that last phrase there, the two become one flesh. That's a powerful statement, a powerful piece of imagery. There is a oneness and a unity in the Christian marriage that impacts this submission. Submission here is... It is also not a submission, not a submission of, of beating somebody into submission, but rather a voluntary submission, that I do this unto my will and unto the Lord as I submit. It is not a blind submission. It, it is not a belittling submission, and it, it's not a submission in any way that you would be asked to or expect to do anything that is contrary to God and his word, right? We're supposed to obey God. God, not man, in that sense, or rather than man. That's chapter 5 of the book of Acts. The best way, I think, to understand the submission might be to understand the Trinity. And you're like, what? Nobody understands the Trinity. Come on. 
hang with me for just a minute, but Orthodox Christianity, Christianity that's been passed down through the generations, understands very clearly uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, understands that Jesus was fully God and fully man, but also submissive to the Father. And so in, it's not on the screen, but just in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul writes there, who, though uh, he was in the form of God, did not uh, count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's a very interesting phrase and, and, and verse and, and what he talks about, but it, it, it lends us to the idea that there's a separation in terms of, of who Jesus is and who God is, but they are completely equal and they're completely together, even though now Jesus is on earth and he is under submission to the Father's will. You've heard multiple times in the gospel stories that Jesus will do only as the Father does or directs him to, or that he uh, speaks only what the Father gives him, right? He also tells us that, you know what, I and the Father are one. And if you know me, you know the Father. That is what I would say is a, a perfect picture of submission. This idea of co-equality and submission can, I think, and should be lived out in the Christian marriage. The two become one. When submission and love are played out correctly in a Christian marriage, it's a beautiful thing. It's an incredible thing. It's a powerful thing. If it is not lived out on one side or the other, it's disastrous, to be honest with you. It's very difficult, and many people live in that. But let me give you a, 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 a real-life testament to how it works. A pastor friend of mine actually posted this on his Facebook page the other day. It's up on the screen. Listen to what this woman writes. I guess the pastor had been teaching on the same subject. He says, my husband is my leader, and I respect him, not because he's male, 100 pounds heavier, or almost a foot taller. It's because he lays down his life, values my voice, grants me honor as a co-heir. I flourish securely in the nook created by his gentle, powerful presence. We are one. Let me tell you, it sounds like that family, that couple, understands Exactly what Paul said when he said, husbands love your wives and wives submit to your husbands. It's not an easy thing, but it is a God thing and going to God in that it works. It works. So that's the, the submissive side of it. There's again the other side of it. Let's go and move to the next verse in verse 19. Husbands, it says, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love your wives. This command even more radical for its time in that culture to be said. In fact, uh, the research that I said, looked at said that there was no even extra biblical writings, meaning out, stuff that's outside of scripture that would be written into the day that would ever, ever tell a man that he is required to love his wife. <laughs> it just wasn't in the culture. It just wasn't there. The, the rule of the day for the husband was to be as harsh as you want to your wife you can own your wife, and love is not required. What a horrible, horrible culture and way to live in a marriage. And Paul is throwing all of that out to these people. That, that's the way they have lived. And so he says, husbands, love your wives. And he uses uh, not the, ver or not the, the, the verb love uh, in, in the romantic sense. Eris love would be the Greek word there. Or, and it is not phileo love, which is brotherly love. It is the love that you and I have heard about. I've talked about it multiple times before. It is agape love. Okay, Agape love is that selfless love. It's uh, the love uh, of God to us. It is our love that we're supposed to express back to God. I, I would also include the idea or the thought that agape love is in service of, right? Because we are in service of Christ, right, as followers of Christ. And so here, agape love, I think, is maybe best understood in service of each other. So we are supposed to be in 
love and service, agape, to each other. I, I told you just a minute ago that Ephesians chapter 5 tells essentially the same truth or same command. He, Paul adds a little bit more to it, and we're going to go there. It'll be up on the screen there. It says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, actually. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, just as Christ does the church. Paul is making the argument again here that as men, we're going to take care of ourselves. Just, that's good. We're going to. <laughs> Wives, they're going to give of themselves probably too much. It's just kind of a, it's a stereotype, but it is often true. But he takes this idea of being able to take care of yourself, guys, which you know you're going to do, and now you need to put that onto your wife. There is a, an old article that was in Psychology Today uh, that actually kind of speaks to this. It was entitled Marriage, Marriages Made to Last. And what they did is they asked a group of husbands and wives individually, what keeps your marriage going? What's the key? What's the key thing? Interesting, there was two phrases that came out of that study. And one was, my spouse is my best friend, and I like my spouse as a person. My spouse is my best friend, and I like my spouse as a person. How does that happen? How does that really take place? We are to love our wives as our own bodies, right? I think it takes place in doing something that you may probably never heard this word. or the, I might be making up a word. I think I got it out of somebody's commentary. But it, it basically, we're loving, or we are to love incarnately, okay? To love incarnately or incarnationally, naturally. We can, or we are, too, as husbands, to incarnate ourselves into our wife's emotions, into their mental processes. And now, men, this is where you're supposed to be writing stuff down. This is where you're supposed to be tuning in. I want you not to miss what I'm going to tell you, because to be quite honest, as I've read this and I've studied this and I've tried to apply it, it is some good information if you truly want to love your wives, as Christ has loved the church. So let me go through this, loving incarnationally, loving your wives. First one, anticipate your wives' emotions. Anticipate your wives' emotions. Do you know if you're going into a situation with your wife, if she's going to feel nervous or she's going to feel uncomfortable or she's feeling pain emotionally or overwhelming? Do you actually, are you in tune with what is going on in the heart and the mind of your wife? An example of this would be, um, and this, my wife and I kind of do this from time to time, if, she go, if we go into a, uh, a public setting somewhere with a group of people, a large group of people, there's times when she kind of feels a little uncomfortable and she'll go to me and say, honey, just don't, don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone. Now, to love incarnationally, yes, I would listen to that and do that. But to really li to live incarnationally or love or incarnationally, I would know going into that, before she even told me, I would say, honey, yeah, I know. Are you, you going to feel uncomfortable? I'll stay with you. See what I'm saying? I, I'm in tune with what's going on emotionally with my wife. R. Kent Hughes, one of my favorite authors and pastors, he says, this means husbands must do all they can to understand her world. And I know, guys are like, I've tried, I've tried. <laughs> I, 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 just keep trying, just keep trying, don't give up. The second aspect I want you to see with this is, is setting aside intentional time where listening, where listening is the priority. So many times it is just a listening ear and our mouths do not have to open. I mess that one up often, but we keep trying. I, I love the proverb that says this, if, 
If one gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame. <laughs> Sometimes we give an answer uh, well before we hear everything we're supposed to hear. And the fact, if we'd listened close enough or incarnationally, we just would have said, I'm with you. I, can, I, I, I understand. No fixing required sometimes, gentlemen. <laughs> to love incarnationally also means to sacrifice or be sacrificing. And not just willing to sacrifice, actually sacrificing, which means you anticipate that your wife is going to need you in a certain situation that is going on, that's coming up in the plans, and you actually cancel your golf outing or you cancel your fishing trip and you make sure that you have incarnationally loved your wife and said, I'm going to be there for her. Now, what's really cool is when you do that and they say, no, 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 you got I'm, I'm good. You go on your trip. And you're like, hallelujah. <laughs> but you loved her incarnationally. So sacrificing. The last one, the last one is this. Intentional, intentionally praying. Again, Pastor Hughes suggests this, and he suggests it in a way where it's not just a bunch of kind of platitudes that you pray, oh, be with my wife, oh, help her today at work. Be with it. No, no, no. You dig a little bit deeper into what she's going on and what she's experiencing and pray very specifically that she has strength to deal with what the situation is going on at work or that she has a set, real strong sense of peace with what's going on with their, your child and that you give her wisdom. And I mean, what I'm talking about is praying in such a way that you understand what is going on and go to God before God with that. And, and again, what, what is, does prayer change God or does it change us? It changes us, right? So when we pray this way, all of a sudden, all these things that we're supposed to understand about our wives all become to come to the forefront of our wives when we pray intentionally and in detail for our wives. So, again, husbands, if you have not filled in the blanks and you're leaving there on your notes and on your outline, I'm going to go through it one more time. It's on the screen. Listen to what it says. Husbands, love your wives incarnationally, anticipating your wives' emotions, okay, setting aside time for listening, actually sacrificing for her, and praying intentionally and intimately for her. So, gentlemen, I hope your pens are losing ink right now. Don't walk away without that wonderful, wonderful idea of loving your wives because Paul told us and God commands us to love our wives. Next, he moves on in the family to the children. Very simply, children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. In everything, for this pleases the Lord. Do I hear an amen from the parents? Amen. Do I hear an amen from the kids? Mm. Well, let me help you out, kids. Now, kids like to ask the question, why? I like to ask the question, why? So why should I obey my parents? Well, what I'm not going to tell you is that God told you so. I'm not going to say that, even though that's what it says. Uh, but I will help you hopefully bring some understanding to why that is important. Truth is, children, your parents have your best interest at heart, even though it may not seem like that all the time. Their demands come from a heart of love and a heart of experience. And their motive is not to make your life miserable. That is not their motive. I can guarantee you, guarantee you, that is not their motive. Very few parents I've ever met that they're, that's the motive. And so, children, you have permission by God to disobey your parents if, if, and only if, 
they tell you to do something contrary to God's word. So, I remember my next door neighbor was cutting down some trees. He had his chainsaw laying there. I was like, man, that's a nice one. Now, if I had told my son, hey, Johnny, why don't you go over there and grab that, my neighbor's chainsaw? And I told him to steal it. He could say, no, Daddy, I'm not allowed to do that. God says, do not steal. Get it? If God tells you not to do it, don't do it. But otherwise, children, obey your parents. Amen? Amen. Well, see how that one flies. Then he moves on. Again, he's going through a list here. He's got six of them. Number four says this. Fathers, do not irritate your children. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Well, the first thing I want to point out to you is that Paul does not include or bring up mothers in this issue <laughs> because it wasn't an issue with mothers for the most part. It was an issue with fathers. I have to strongly believe when you hear the context of, of the culture that Paul was living in that, you know, uh, he saw firsthand multiple occasions where fathers were just exasperating their children, just discouraging their children, just doing nothing but demanding and putting down. And so he says, do not irritate your children. Do not provoke your children so that they become discouraged. I have seen over years as a coach and a father and being around other families and things like that where fathers have just done so much disservice to their children. They have run them into the ground in sports and other ways. They have destroyed their self-worth because of, of hurtful teasing and joking even that should never have happened. And I do understand very clearly there are times where the father's hand, the strong hand of the father, maybe the discipline comes there, that it has to be there, it's right, but you know what? The fathers have to be very, very wise in the way they use that position. I love what it says in Psalm 103, verse 13. It says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. The first part of that says, a father shows compassion to his children. My question to you fathers, how much compassion do you feel for your children? How much compassion? Maybe, maybe that is a, a first feeling before I got to make sure you do such and such. Maybe there's a heart of compassion that needs to drive you to encourage and strengthen and guide your son or daughter. And so Paul says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. A good word for the Christian family. But here in these last two, Paul moves away from the, the nuclear family proper, I guess, here, and includes instruction to the bond servants. It says, bond servants, obey with a sincere heart, okay? Obey everything, those who are uh, their earthly masters, not by way of eye service or people pleasing, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. In the Christian family, in those days, there were what they called servants or bond servants, okay? Not all Christians were poor and of meager means and were servants themselves. Some were, but not all. So there were Christian families, people of, of means and wealth that, that got saved and they had servants in their household. Now what's interesting about the, the word and the translations here that, that bond servant is actually translated servant. It's actually translated slave on multiple occasions. It's simply the word doulos in the Greek, okay? It's also here used as bond servant. A lot of times they use, I think, the translation bond servant. I'm not positive on this, but a lot of times they use that when it is inferred that the servitude is of a voluntary nature, okay? So like in Romans 1.1, Paul essentially calls himself a bond servant of Christ. He, he voluntarily, uh, under the call of God, submits himself to Christ. 
But the truth was, in this context, slavery was a real, real thing. Sla slavery in the Roman world was horrible. People were thought to be as tools or objects. It was very similar, I think, to probably what was being taken place in the UK and in this country in the 1800s. There was that kind of slavery that was being going on. So the command here, I believe, covers everything from slavery to bond servant idea. And, and, and what he's telling these people is, man, you, you got you to gotta work for these people in a good way. I can't imagine if somebody was in such a horrible situation and Paul gave them these instructions, how hard it would have been to take them. He tells them first there to do it not by way of eye service or people pleasing. Eye service and people pleasing. You, you, you get the idea that I, I, the best representation of eye service and people pleasing is... is uh, Think of gym class back in, in like junior high, okay? And you're doing the fitness tests and practicing and that. You're doing your push-ups, and, and when the, the gym teacher wasn't looking, you're just sitting there laying on the ground. When he starts looking at you, you're, oh, yeah, I'm pumping them out. I'm pumping them out. You know, how many people do that at work? How many people just start stepping it up because the boss is walking by? That's not serving from the heart. As he says, with sincerity of heart, we are to serve and fear the Lord we should serve. You have to get your heart right where you're serving. Now, in verse 23, I think he begins to give us some more motivations, if you will, perspective on our work environment. Whatever you do, do heartily. As to the Lord and not unto men. The question being answered essentially is, who are you really working for? When you work, when you go to work, I know you get a paycheck from the company you work for, but who, who are you really, really working for? Yeah, the Lord. Your, your work, my friends, is a God thing. <laughs> always has, always will be. He continues, I think, with some more perspective and more motivation really for the Christian. He says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoers will be paid back for the wrong he has done, but there is no partiality. God shows no partiality. And so he, he gives them the real deal, the real what's going on here. You're going to get rewarded for your work and God's going to justly uh, take care of those who do not work in a right manner. God shows no favoritism here. He sees all. And so this should be, if, even if you have to work for a jerk, okay, motivation for you to do it unto the Lord. Uh, won't raise hands about people working for a jerk because i got people working for me here, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> But you get my drift. You get my drift. So we work unto the Lord. Again, this was such a hard word, especially to the bond servants of that day. The last one, number six, says, Bosses, treat your staff well. It reads in verse 1 of chapter 4, Masters, treat your bond service justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Again, this gets pretty radical. Again, the culture was, I'm the boss. There, there, there was no employee rights. There was no union there. It was expected if you work for so-and-so, you do whatever that person tells you to do, no questions asked. That's where that command comes to light. Again, a hard word for the masters of those days to treat their employees a little differently. I, this changes societies when businesses and bosses actually live this out. This is so transformal. I mean, just, 
just think about the, the environment that Chick-fil-A has created in giving Sundays off to their employees. And if you know anything about the Chick-fil-A infrastructure, about how they treat employees, I've talked to multiple people that have worked for Chick-fil-A. I don't think I've ever heard a single bad story about how uh, working for them went. It has all been positive. And it's because they understood this command. I learned this lesson a long time ago when I was working for Merritt Corporation. I was working over at Holy Cross Hospital. If you go around the Washington Beltway towards Silver Spring, you see a big building before you get to the uh, Mormon Tapel, ta Tabernacle Crier building there. The, uh, before you get there, there's another building. It's Holy Cross Hospital. I worked there for four years. When I worked there, I managed housekeeping staff. I had floors eight through five. These people cleaned the patient rooms and the floors and took out the trash on those floors. And my job was to make sure that they were able to do their job and do it correctly. I was like 25 years old, 26 years old. Each one of those were almost double my, my age and I was their boss. I used to go up to them and tell them the things they needed to do or, man, you missed this in this room, you gotta go back and get this and yeah, the nurses need this and all this. And it got to the point where some, I actually was making some of the housekeeping women cry. I was like, I just thought I was telling them what to do. What I learned later was that they just wanted me to know them as people and not just servants or housekeepers. They wanted me to address them as people. That's what they wanted. When you put yourself or you are in a position of leadership, authority over another person, maybe this is at work, maybe this is at school, maybe this is, you're, you're a, a small group leader, maybe, maybe you, you're a leader in a band, or where, there's multiple places where you find yourself in kind of a position of authority or the boss, more so than you probably realize. What this verse of scripture is trying to tell us here is that we're to treat people justly and fairly, really to treat them as human beings and understand who they are. And knowing that we have a master in heaven <laughs> that does the very, very same thing so wonderfully for us, right? Amen to that. We are never to treat people like possessions. All these commands are relationship commands within the family and I think to the extended family in the sense of the work environment. And I think this, I think this flows out of that. But we're, we will never be able to do this without the power of God in us to live out this way. And he helps us so dramatically to take on essentially what I think are still radical commands in our day. It is, it's radical for su submission from the wife. It, it's radical for a husband to really intimately love their uh, wife. It, it, it's radical now, I guess, for children to obey their parents, right? <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. The, the, these were radical then, but they're still radical today in that sense. But they're also, when we do them, promised, I believe, a, a blessing and a family, a Christian family, that God can use in a powerful, powerful way. So what, what's the next step I want you to do? What do I want you to do with this truth? So Ben, ben you guys can start coming up here. But what can you do with this? I, got, I only got one thing for you to do today. Just do this. Ask God to show you something you heard today and make it your own. There was a ton of information if you were a husband and a boss and a father, man, you just got nailed. <laughs> you got all kinds of options, though. But, but what I want you to do is just, just make this, this passage your own and begin to pray and incarnate that wisdom and that what is God saying to me? What does he want me to do? What does he want me to change? Just take one. If all you can handle is one, that's fine. Just work on one of those things. 
So wives, support your, support your husbands in being the leader that God wants them to be. That's a big role. Husbands, love your wives. Love them incarnationally, deeply. Children, obey. Don't argue. Just do it, right? Just do, just do it, just like they said in Nike. Yeah, just do it. Trust that mom and God actually have your best interest at heart. Fathers, maybe you're supposed to talk a little differently to your children. Maybe you're supposed to well up in you a little more compassion for their children, whether they're grown up or whether they're still in the house. If you're an employee in any way, okay, maybe you need to step up your game and not waste so much time on your phone and social media at work. Maybe realize it doesn't matter if the boss is watching what I do. Maybe I know God is watching me, and that's who my boss is. Maybe that's what you need to incarnate today. And if you're an employer or a leader or a boss in any shape, way, or form, understand that you have people that you are leading and guiding and can impact and influence. Ultimately, if you do this right, you will, can and, and hopefully have a heart to share your faith with them, and you can impact them for eternity. Amen to that. God will help you in all of this. So if we may, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close, and then we'll turn it over to you, buddy, and we'll, we'll praise our way out. But just pray with me. You can respond in several ways. Are you ready to receive Christ as your Savior? I didn't really talk about the gospel so much, but are you ready to receive Christ? Do you trust him enough that he was God-man, died for your sins, rose from the dead, and offers you a free gift of salvation, eternity with him, new life right here and now with the dwelling of his Holy Spirit to live a life like that. If you can trust that today, I encourage you, let us know, let us help you in that decision. Number two, maybe God is saying it's time for me to follow and be obedient to baptism. The first act of obedience for the Christian is to follow in baptism. Jesus started his ministry by being baptized. And so if God is laying in your heart about a decision about being baptized and you've received him as Savior and you haven't been baptized yet, I encourage you, let's talk and, and, and see if that's your best next step. And if you've not become a partner with this church, and maybe God is leading you to get close and more connected and make a commitment to, to live out your faith through this congregation, We'd love to help you in that, too. Let, let us know. Respond to us either through our email, through the website, after service. Come, come and tap me on the shoulder. Love to help you in that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for the way you love us and the way you, you instruct us. The word today is not easy, but, man, is it powerful. Lord, we ask that your spirit would guide us and speak to us. I pray that every person that hears this message today says, you know what, Lord, I want at least one thing I can work on, one thing that I can incarnate, one thing that I can focus on. Don't let me lose focus on that throughout this whole week and the next week. Let this be a changing peace in me that puts me closer and more like you in your image. Father, I pray that we will do this today, that we'll walk away asking, praying, letting God transform us into your image. Father, we pray this in the precious, precious name of Jesus. And everybody says, amen, amen. Let's stand up. Let's worship him uh, 